Okay, so welcome to everyone for another journal club for Metropolitan South Africa. So those of you that have heard it currently now, um, Prof. Beardman unfortunately won't be able to attend our talk. Her husband was involved in a car accident, so she had to rush off to the hospital, a very unfortunate event, so our prayers go out to her. But I'd also like to introduce her, her bio to the group. She is a very impressive researcher and doctor and you can see on the screen, she's the head of the Division of Hepatology, Department of Medicine at UCT, the head of liver and liver transport clinics at Krutuskua. Uh, she's part of various associations um, that involve liver care, liver diseases, liver management, the lead consultant in the National Guidelines for Management Prevention of Viral Hepatitis Africa, has research interests in viral hepatitis, drug-induced liver injuries, liver transportations, transplant, transplantations, and novel in immunosuppressants, so everything liver related. You can think of, I think, when Wendy Spearman has done in her career as a medical doctor and as a researcher. And the topic that we're going to work, we we're going to cover was non-alcoholic liver disease, which is a very serious uh, liver disease that affects up to 25% of us in the population, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm just going to share her paper, which she published recent, recently in um, Lancet, and I will share it in the chat link as well. So, unfortunately, I don't have much, much of a speech prepared for this, but I can share this paper with many people. And you can see uh, um, the title, Epidemiology risk factors, social determinants of health, current management for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this was published last year, the end of last year in Lancet, a very good journal. So I do encourage everyone to, to download this paper. If you can't download it, uh, I can send you the, the PDF. You can email me, I'll put my email address as well. Um, but yeah, just to go through it very briefly, so non-alcoholic non liver disease, leading cause of chronic liver disease globally, estimated to affect approximately 25% of the world's population. The data about the prevalence incidence in Africa is scarce, but the estimated is 13.5% for the general population. So her group, she's part of the behalf of the Gastroenterology and Hepatology Association of Sub-Saharan Africa. Her group consists of various African countries as well, um, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, uh, Cameroon, uh, to name a few. So it is a huge organization that they are involved in and they do a lot of research and they're looking at the, the, the prevalence on the clinical side, or how to manage it. So this is a great introduction into non-alcoholic liver my alcoholic fatty liver disease. So I'm going to share this, the DOR in the chat. And those that cannot have access or don't have access to it, I'll also share my email address. So let me do that now. So in the chat room now, I will share both the DOR Do that now. Chat to everyone. There is the DOR and the name of the paper. And those that don't have access to it are free to email me here at nmr.nw at gmail.com. And I do encourage any, anyone who's interested in any sort of liver disease, liver involvement, anything to do with liver at all to go through that paper, it was an excellent paper. And I can't really do it justice because um, Prof Wendy Spearman is obviously the leading author there. She led the whole um, team on that paper and she was, I think, the perfect expert to give more on that. And the topic today we chose was uh, based upon a, a vote we, voting we did. So 
can share that as well. So a while ago, I uploaded this onto the communications group and on the forum as a topic of health, human health, and numerous people, five people out of 20, voted for this one paper on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So that is what the focus of this journal club was on, is on the effects of exercise on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and non-targeted metabolomics. So unfortunately, I, um, the background on that, I do not have much to say, but we luckily we do have an expert who is with us, Dr. Ilsa Dupree, and she is from our Center for Human Metabolomics. And luckily she's also been doing some research into bowel acids and her postgraduate, uh, her postdoctoral research was on hepatitis C. So she's been, um, she had a PhD done in 2012 on metabolomics of tuberculosis. She is one of the leaders in our team at Center for Human Metabolomics. So let me share her bio as well. There she is. Um, so you can always contact her for contract research services at the Center for Human Metabolomics. And at a later date, at a later journal club, she will give a more extensive um, introduction of the Center for Human Metabolomics for everyone, because it is a quite a big um, center and quite a lot to talk about. So at a later journal club, we will go through that in more detail. But she's just going to cover the, the basics of the paper that we we selected this week. That's one of the latest papers on the non-targeted non metabolomics of non-alcoholic liver disease. So also I know it's a bit early in the talk <laughs> to bring you in. <laughs> but are you ready to share with us yes. your insights on that? So I believe you want to tell us more on how to get high impact paper or how they did it in this paper. Yes, thank you, Shane, for the introduction. Um, someone introduces me, it always sounds like you're speaking of someone else. But um, <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so the idea was that um, the first talk would have been on the details of the disease itself. And then I would have just continued. So um, let me just share my screen. There you go. Can you see my screen? Okay. There we go. So the first talk would have been on NIFLD and I didn't really prepare anything on the disease itself. We have enough time now, so we can probably go through a bit of the introduction as well, just to get an idea of the disease. I didn't really prepare it. So um, what I wanted to do was to go through the metabolomics part of this paper, specifically the methods and results section. Because this is an untargeted LCMS analysis um, with a lot of different tissues. Uh, so I think, yeah, I'm just going to continue. I'm, my point here is that the methods that they applied can be widely applied. It's not necessarily focused on NAFLD. It was a well thought out and well planned study, uh, very good methods that they used. And I think um, I'm still going to focus on the methods um, instead of the disease itself. I know the audience is probably people who are uh, part of metabolomics essay or who are actually interested in metabolomics. So I'm going to focus on the metabolomics side. Um, I know that the audience is also mainly students. So I'm going to uh, um, talk a bit about how to publish metabolomics data as well. Um, I wanted to make a very nice slideshow with flying figures and so on, but I thought it would be better to look at the actual paper itself. It will give you a better idea of a good metabolomics publication. Um, so to start, this public was published in scientific reports. It's ha it has an impact factor of 4.3, which is very good for a metabolomics paper. 
So initially when I opened the paper, I thought nature, and I thought to myself, how did they get mesogolomics in nature? Um, but it's published by the nature group. It's not the nature um, journal. Still a very good journal, peer reviewed and open access. Um, when you consider a journal, please look at the impact factor before you just um, submit left and right. I think it's also important at this point to mention that as South Africans, I think we tend to be modest and I think we tend to think that we are not good enough to publish in Nature or Lancet. You just saw that Prof Spearman published in Lancet. So it's, it's possible. I think um, the other day we had a talk from a guy from the US it was a super impressive talk on his research and afterwards everybody was stunned. But when we looked at his work again um, in more detail, we, we all had the same sort of feeling that, oh, we can also do this. You know, we, we can actually also do this. And he published in Nature, the Nature Journal. So I think in South Africa, we also, we are pushed to publish in numbers. And so we tend to split up, split up the work into different papers to get more papers instead of combining everything to go into a massive impact factor journal. But it's just the way things work in South Africa. It's what the universities expect. It's what the government expects from you. But I think um, for the students out there, I think it's worthwhile to every now and then try to work on a paper for two or three years and get it into a super great journal as well because you have the ability we have the knowledge we have the methods we have everything in south africa to publish we are really good enough i think we tend to forget that okay so let's look at this paper and i think the reason it it was published in this good journal was because they didn't just use one matrix they they looked at untargeted metabolomics in four different matrices from a relatively large cohort group. Um, as we go on, I will also point out um, why this is a very good untargeted approach for me personally. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at the abstract. So first of all, in your abstract, there's a, uh, can't see my own notes. So there's the aim of the study, the approach that you want to follow and the hypoth hypothesis. The hypothesis in this um, case is that they feel that exercise will benefit patients with non-alcoholic fatty disease, fatty liver disease, in a FLD. So the aim of this study is to identify metabolic changes associated with NAFLD in humans upon exercise intervention without diet change across four sample types, adipose tissue, that's fat tissue, plasma, urine, and stool. And the approach they're going to follow will be untargeted LCMS analysis. I see that Dylan is in the audience. So Dylan, please forgive me if I try to sound like an LCMS expert, because you, I know that you are a super LCMS expert. So I feel intimidated. Um, okay. I didn't prepare... The introduction really but let's go through just the first paragraph just to get an idea of NAFLD and the importance thereof. Um, I, I was going to leave this to Prof Spearman who is the expert. Um, so I'm just going to read this, um, please forgive me. So approximately 25% of the population worldwide is affected by non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, making it the most common liver disease worldwide and a major public health concern. 25% um, of the population, that's super, super high. I think we work with rare diseases all the time. So we have one in a million cases, 25%, that's very high. Um, in a FLD encompasses liver conditions ranging from steatosis through steohepatitis to liver cirrhosis. In a FLD is also associated with insulin resistance and components of metabolic syndrome, including obesity, type two diabetes, hyperlipidemia, thereby making NAFLD a multi-system disease. This is why they are looking at all the different sample matrices, 
because the disease is multi-system. So it does affect the whole body, if I can put it like that. Um, physical exercise is the first line of therapy for patients with NAFLD. And clinical studies focusing on physical exercise intervention have shown that exercise decreases weight, uh, waist circumference, body fat, blood pressure uh, in, FA, in a FLD patients. Okay, so now we have a better understanding of what this is um, so, um, and why they wanted to investigate this specific topic. I'm not going to go through the rest of the introduction. I want to take most of my time to go through the methods. The study was done in Finland, and there's a whole group, but they are all from Finland. Um, so it just shows you the, uh, they are from different departments of the same university, but it shows you that working together can also get things done uh, in a proper way. Okay. So these are, this is one of those weird papers where they have the results before the methods. I like seeing the methods first. Um, but I'm going to go to the end. Forgive me for jumping around. Uh, so there's the methods. Okay. Ah, sorry. Okay. So this was a randomized controlled study, um, meaning that they had a cohort initially that were all the same. So they looked for patients with certain inclusion and exclusion criteria, one set of patients that only had one group. In other metabolomic study, you will tend to see controls and diseased patients or patients with this disease versus that disease. In this case, the whole cohort has exactly the same inclusion and exclusion criteria. They then split the cohort in two and they do an intervention for one of the two groups. Um, the intervention in this instance was exercise. So except for the intervention, the two groups were both exactly the same or almost the same. They tried to match the groups according to BMI, age, gender, uh, diabetes to, um, and then there's some information on the participants. So for me, this is... Um, probably one of the best papers that I've read recently where they describe the inclusion and exclusion criteria the best. So they had very, very strict inclusion and exclusion criteria, which is highly important in metabolomic studies. They included patients between 18 and 70 years. For me, that's the only thing that was a bit, um, I don't know, lenient. We have done some studies at the CHM where we've shown that age does in fact have a massive dif uh, massive influence on the metabolome of healthy individuals. We've also done a recent study where we've shown that gender actually has a massive influence on the normal metabolome. So um, just being a male or a female can have a difference. Um, so they include a very large age range here, but um, still, that's okay. They were spread out evenly throughout the two different groups. Um, the BMI had to be below 35 um, kilogram per square meter. They had to be diagnosed with NAFLD um, using the normal method. So that's ultrasound and MRI and tomography, tomography, I think. Um, subjects using metformin and all of these other statins and all of the other blood pressure medication and cholesterol medication were still eligible. Even uh, patients with hypothyroidism, uh, if it was controlled, they were eligible. The exclusion criteria included acute illness or current evidence of acute or chronic inflammatory or infectious disease. No subjects with hepatitis B or C or autoimmune hepatitis, Wilson disease, hematochromosis um, or unstable hypothyroidism were included. So that's basically any other liver disease that's not in a FLD. If you had other liver disease, you were excluded. Um, also, they excluded patients who were not willing to undergo MRI. And this is quite funny. They say because of claustrophobia. 
um, as one reason. So if you had claustrophobia and you didn't want to do an MRI, you couldn't be included. Any neurological, musculoskeletal, cardiorespiratory conditions um, that put patients at risk for exercise would, would be, were excluded. Participants um, who did regular exercise or followed a specific diet program in three months before were excluded. No subjects um, diagnosed with diabetes type 1 or type 2 with insulin or GLP-1 treatment were included. Um, in addition, if you were diagnosed with depression, mental illness, making you unable to understand the nature of the, uh, the or the scope of the study, you were also excluded. Um, um, smoking and alcohol abuse were also excluded. They even define alcohol abuse. Um, so I bet that they had a questionnaire where they asked you all these questions and I think it was a very large questionnaire, but I, um, from my side, this is a fantastic inclusion and exclusion criteria. So you try to get the groups that you want to uh, investigate to be as similar as possible. Um, the diets, uh, the subjects were instructed to keep their dietary habits unchanged. They even had to keep a record book of what they ate for four days or something, I think. Yeah. So for three weekdays and a weekend day, you had to write down what you ate just to keep that constant, the exercise. Again, um, they didn't just give the same exercise programs. All the individuals, they actually tested the individual's physical capacity and their lung function. And they did a lot of tests that you can go through. Um, they also did an EKG to test your current fitness level. And then they gave you a exercise program based on that. So the intensity of 85% of the max, whatever, whatever. So that was actually based on the test that they do to um, uh, pr prior to including you. So your cardiorespiratory fitness then determined the exercise program. Um, so they also increased the exercise program in the group that did exercise. So uh, in the beginning, they had about a 40 minute exercise routine and by the end it was at about 50 minutes, high intensity training. Um, so they gradually increased the training time. Um, a control group was just giving the normal care. So the control group were treated as if they, like they would have been treated anyways, even if they weren't in the study. Um, but they were instructed not to do too much exercises. So they actually had to keep their sedentary lifestyle. So I would have been a good candidate, yeah, except that I don't have the disease. Um, okay. They measured body weight, waist circumference, circumference uh, body composition. They did some blood pressure monitoring, um, energy expenditure and rates, um, glucose monitoring. They me measured the liver fat percentage with nuclear MRI, blood samples. Uh, okay, yeah, you get the samples, okay. So what was also good about this study that you do not really see in all metabolomic studies is that they did all the normal biochemistry testing. So they have, I'll show you a bit later, they have a whole table full of parameters that they tested for these individuals that were not actually results from the metabolomics. So they did the normal biochemistry workup that you would do for a patient if you do a yearly checkup basically. Okay, so here we get to something more interesting that's also very important in metabolomics is sampling. Um, we have seen here, not me specifically, but um, in the focus area, there were some groups who actually investigated the variation in the metabolite profiles if you collect samples into different tubes. Um, so even if you use if you use different tubes, you will get a difference in your metabolic profile. So it's very, very important if you do metabolomic studies that you keep your sampling process 
100% constant. We have an SOP, standard operating procedure, that gives this information to doctors and any medical practitioners collecting samples for metabolomics. You have to stay constant. If you use the wrong tube, you cannot rely on your metabolomics results. You cannot, for example, use EDTA and get reliable metabolomics results. It does interfere. So make sure that you collect your samples in the correct way. But the more important thing is that you collect the samples in exactly the same way for all your patients. Um, a fear of needles has also been identified is something that can influence your metabolomics profile. So if you have patients who are super scared of giving blood through needles, they had a different profile in relation to patients who were not scared of needles and blood at all. Um, preferably the same person should also sample the blood. Okay, so let's go through how they sample these. So blood were drawn fasting. So that was kept constant. Everybody was fasting. Um, and they also use the same blood samples for insulin and APOB analysis. Um, they never mention how they go from blood to serum, but um, we will forgive them for that because that should be obvious, but it's not included in the methods anyway. Stool samples were collected in a plastic container with a lid by the subject themselves while wearing gloves. Um, so anyways, I think yeah, I agree. You wouldn't want someone else to collect that. So they collected it themselves at week zero, six and 12. So week zero refers to when the, when, um, the study started, but no exercise was done yet. Exercise was just started after week zero point. So that's the before sample. 12 is the after sample. Six is the in the middle sample. So it was a time-dependent collection there um, and frozen. And then urine, that's also important how you store your samples. A lot of studies have shown that storing your samples at minus 20 or minus 80 or 4 degrees can have a massive influence on the stability of your metabolites. Also, and this is interesting, I've read a paper recently where they say, the storage itself doesn't have a big influence and freezing and thawing. The influence isn't as big as how long you take after sample collection to cool your sample down. So if you collect blood from a patient and you keep it on the bench for an hour, it will have a huge, it will make a huge different difference to your metabol metabolite levels where uh, you know, compared to when you take the blood sample and you freeze it immediately or when it stands at the bench for um, four hours, whatever. Because you can imagine that the metabolism is still continuing in that warm sample that you just collected. So you have to immediately freeze the samples. So also try to keep that constant. If you collect a sample from the time of collection to the time of putting it in the freezer should also be the same for all the patients. It's not always possible, especially if it's stool samples, I would imagine. Okay. Urine were collected over 24 hours. This is also a nice um, addition to the study for me because we normally take urine just once, one sample, but obviously urine's um, composition will change throughout the day, depending on what you eat, what you drink, um, if you exercise, if you sleep, whatever. So they took 24 hour urine collection, which is a, a much better representation. And then uh, they did an open biopsy from the abdominal um, tissue. I haven't done that yet. So that's well done for them to have gotten clearance by the patients to do that. They did some normal statistics on the clinical parameters. And the main reason for this was so that they can actually um, divide the two groups into equal clinical groups. They did the mean and standard deviation for all the measures, such as the, the liver function testing, ALT, AST, insulin, DG, uh, GGT, and then 
the reason they did this was to get the mean of the different groups at the different times. Um, remember, they, they took these parameters, they measured these parameters before and after the study, week zero and week 12. So in each instance, they, they took the mean and the standard deviation and so on to give you a summary of the, the group's performance. Now the interesting part, and that's why we're here. Um, I just want you to realize that everything that I've mentioned up to this point is not metabolomics, but it's so important to get everything right before metabolomics so that you can trust your metabolomics and your metabolite results. Um, the planning of these studies are crucial. Every single step can change your results. Sample preparation. Okay, these guys did untargeted metabolomics. Some people will refer to it as non-targeted. Some say untargeted, it's the same thing. Untargeted means that basically you do not know what you're looking for. So you want to scan your sample and to find as much information as possible. Um, you would normally get a spectrum that you will then compare to a, a, a library spectrum to get a match or a name. In targeted metabolomics, you know beforehand what you want to look for. So if you want to look for alanine, glycine, taurine, and phenylalanine amino acids, before that, you will set up your method to look for only those. You will inject standard compounds, so you will literally go and inject alanine into your system to see this is what alanine looks like. And I'm sure this is what it looks like because I analyzed it on my system. So that's targeted. In this case, it's untargeted. And they also used LCMS, two different LCMSs, by the way, but we'll get there. So how did they prepare these samples? Plasma samples were prepared by adding acetonitrile and and that's it. Urine were prepared by also adding a cold acetonitrile. The reason they add acetonitrile is to precipitate out the proteins. You're not doing proteomics, you are doing metabolomics. So you want to get the proteins out there because they are very large compounds that can interfere with your analysis in a big way. Um, so the precipitated samples were then filtered by centrifugation. So they run it through a filter and centrifuge. Um, so that they can get rid of all the proteins. Um, the adipose tissue or the fat tissue and the stool were homogenized um, by adding um, methanol in a ratio. This is also important. So if you work with something that you have to weigh, do not try to weigh it exactly to the milligrams that you need. It will be impossible to weigh off 100 milligram exactly for every patient sample. So what is, is suggested is that you rather make up a concentration ratio. So for every 100 milligram, you will add 500 microliters of methanol. So you'll have the same concentration. It's like OROS. I love OROS as an example. When you make up OROS, if you want to make up a glass of OROS or you make up five liters of OROS. With the five liters, you will start with more OROS, but at the end, you will have exactly the same concentration of OROS. So this is what you do here. Stool samples are not really the same as OROS, but you get the point, okay? So it's important to standardize by concentration and not by weight, because you will have issues. You will be in the lab for five weeks just to weigh off your samples. So in this way, um, the samples were then um, homogenized in a beat raptor. So this is nice about um, living in the future is that you get these homogenizers, you add a bead such as a, a, a tungsten bead or a stainless steel bead to your sample, and you then shake it at a very high frequency, the bead will um, homogenize your sample so it will um, sort of break it up until it's almost like a mushy, watery substance. So in the olden days, they used to just add solvent and then wait overnight for the homogenization to happen. Now you can just add a bead, you shake it very fast and it's broken up and homogenized. 
<clears throat> the reason you want to do this is in a, any solid thing, so in feces or cells or whatever, you want to break up the cell, um, the cell so that the content can be released. You also want to homogenize the sample. So, for example, when you do analysis on lung, uh, lungs of mice, so you take a whole mouse lung, you will homogenize it because some of the metabolites and drugs and anything that you're looking at will be more concentrated in a certain part of the lung than the other part. That's just biology. So you have to homogenize it to get um, to get all the information out of the whole sample that you have. Okay. Um, it was then also filtered um, and kept at four degrees. So it's important to realize at this step that this is an untargeted sample prep. They basically want to homogenize and take out the proteins. Um, if you do a more targeted analysis, um, and not targeted, but if you want to target lipids or um, more water-soluble compounds, of so forth, you would do a more targeted um, sample preparation. So if you want to get only lipids from your sample, you would add, for example, chloroform that can dissolve lipids very well, and you also add water. So this is like mixing oil and water. Everything that can dissolve in the oil will be in the oil and that the things that will dissolve in the water will go to the water. So then you can decide which fraction of those you'll take. So you can do a sort of targeted, untargeted metabolomics in that way. So to target a specific group, uh, what people also tend to do is they do an organic acid extraction from urine, for example, but then they run it in an untargeted way on the GCMS. So your analytical side will be untargeted, but your extraction will be more targeted. In this case, it's important to see that they didn't do this at all. They took the proteins out, and that's it. Sample will be used as is. For LCMS analysis, they did two different LCMS analysis. And if this was a live audience, I would have asked why, but unfortunately, I now have to answer my own questions. So. First, they did the Q-Exactive, um, um, they used the Q-Exactive MS with the UPLS doing reversed phase chromatography. The mobile phases consisted of water and methanol with a bit of formic acid. I'm not going to go through the, the gradient with you. Uh, it's important to see that they acquired data on a positive and a negative electron ionization mode. In other words, they did reverse chromatography. They ran the samples through the, uh, the LC once. So it was chromatography done once, mass spectrometry done twice using two different, um, um, a positive and a negative ESI. Um, the QC samples, um, yeah, I think I'm somewhat missed the QC samples. Uh, somewhere where they actually discuss how they make up the QC samples. Yeah, sorry, I missed this. So quality control, so quality control you use to see if you're consistent or if you are consistent and if your system is consistent and if your method is consistent. So what they do here, and that's what we all do, is they make a pooled QC, a pooled control sample. They took two microliters from all the samples and they made a mix of that per sample uh, matrix. So they took two microliters and they mixed it and then they have a control sample. You want the control sample to be representative of all your samples because you could potentially get some metabolites in one in some of the samples and not in the others. So you want to have a mix of all your samples and this is then used to assess because in theory, every time that you analyze your quality control sample, it should give you the exact same result. In theory, it never happens. It's just theory, but at least it gives you indication if something went wrong in your analysis or with your system. Okay, so what they did was they quality control samples were injected at the beginning 
and after 12, every 12 samples. So when they started, they injected the QC and then at every, after every 12 samples, data were acquired in centroid mode. So that was the first analysis. The second analysis they did on the same samples was a UPLC coupled to an accurate mass cutoff. In this case, they didn't do reverse phase chromatography, they did helichromatography. The mobile phases were 50% nitrile, acetonitrile, 90%. So if they say 50%, you assume that the other 50% is water. 90%, the other 10% will be water. And then they added ammonium formate to both of these. This was also injected in positive and negative mode. So at the end, remember you did two different, two different chromatographies and all of them were analyzed positive and negative. So you end up with four different files for your, for, that's your final samples, uh, sample data. I made this dark orange because I was super confused when I got to this point and I read it and I felt I had deja vu, but I realized that the journal actually published this whole paragraph again. So I thought that they did three LCMS approaches, but they didn't. It's just that paragraph again repeated. So it was a, a publishing error. Um, now my question would have been, what's the difference? Why did they do this too? Um, I would have asked that if I had a life, I know that you're alive, but I mean, if I had an audience here in front of me. So let me tell you what the difference is. You see there I marked it, there's the one and there's the two. So what's the difference? I actually made a note for you there. So in reverse phase chromatography, you have a non-polar stationary phase. Remember, nonpolar doesn't like water. Nonpolar hates water. Polar loves water. So you have a nonpolar stationary phase, it means that you have a nonpolar column. The column is nonpolar. So everything that's nonpolar will stick to your column. And as you put your polar mobile phase through, your compounds will sort of um, get loose from your. A column and go out to the MS. The polar compounds will pass straight through because they cannot really attach to the column. That's reverse phase. Um, normal phase is the opposite of reverse phase. So in normal phase, you'll have a more polar stationary phase and you have a non-polar mobile phase. But helic is super normal in a way. So I like to refer to it as super normal because helic is where your polar phase is almost always, or most of it will be water. So helic stands for hydrophilic interaction. Remember, philic means love. So hydro love, they love the water. These compounds love water, and that's why it's a helix. So it's a hydrophilic interaction chromatography is for those compounds that really loves water. Um, and, um, as opposed to in reverse phase, the ones that doesn't love water. Um, so here you'll have a polar stationary phase. So you'll have a polar column and your mobile phase will also contain a lot of water. And you can see it there, it says the mobile phase is 50% acetronitrile, 50% water, 90% acetronitrile, 10% water. In your other run, you had mobile phases, water, 100% water. The other one was methanol without any water, pure methanol. Okay, so this is more of a water analysis. Why would you do this um, in helic? Uh, the polar compounds. So these, is, these are the compounds that really loves water. The ones that are charged will retain very, very well to your column, okay? So they will, they will sit on the column because the column will attract them very well. And then your hydrophobic neutral compounds will move through. The ones that has a phobia for water, those are the ones that hates water, 
they will move through. So the reason um, that they did helic and reverse phase is to, in reverse phase, they wanted to look at a very good separation and a very good illusion of your non-polar compounds. And in the helic, they want to see the polar compounds. Very good approach, well thought out, well um, executed. Um, this is to get the most from your LCMS um, as possible. I see the time is moving on. So Shane, please tell me if the time is up. I'm all, almost done with the method section now, but I think it's very important to go through the methods in detail for audience, the audience that we have. Uh, yeah, I think you're doing great um, step by okay. step. I think the audience will be appreciating this. So keep going. Okay, thanks. Okay, so now um, you have your four data sets, remember? So you have your not your um, polar, non-polar, or your helic and your reverse phase chromatography data sets that were both analyzed on your MS in a positive and negative mode. Positive and negative is to get the compounds that will if you spray them with electrons, they will get a positive charge. Negative will get a negative charge. I'm not going to go into that detail now. Um, so now what you have to do is you have to, you, you get spectra and you get results for every single sample that you analyze. There will be slight retention shifts between the different samples that you run. So in order to align this, um, alignment means that you want to you want to tell software, we want to do it alone, but doing it is just problematic. So you want to tell the software, if I find this compound at this time in this sample, it's the same as the same compound, same spectrum at the same time in a different sample. So in a way, you just want to put all the mass specs or all the, the chromatograms in that sense over each other so that they align properly. Um, and then so to remove that little change in the retention time. And you can do this with, with online um, commercially available um, software programs. You Most of the instruments has this as an add-on to their own software. You can use um, MS Dial, which is an online software program. Um, you can, yeah, so in this case, they, they exported the raw data, they put it into MS Dial, and then they did the peak picking and alignment. Peak picking is to tell you, okay, this is a peak, this is not a peak, this is junk, this is above the signal to noise, this is below the signal to noise. It's a lot of things that happen. But what happens at the end of this is you get an Excel sheet with samples and features. So your one axis will be samples, the other one will be features. And in the middle, you will have areas. Um, they identified 134,000 features in this case. So in at this point, you still refer to it as, as features because you haven't identified what it is. You just know it's something, something with a mass spec that's there. So this was done. Um, for all four analytical methods. So for all four analytical methods and all four matrices, they ended up with 134,000 features. I'm sounding like the previous president now. Okay, so that's what they had. Now you have to imagine if you want to annotate or give names to 134,000 features, you will do 17 PhDs after each other to just get the annotations it's not possible. Um, so you need to sort of process your data in a way to identify which of these features are really important, which means something is a junk, do we wanna use it further? So they did a few pre-processing steps here. Um, they did it for every sample matrix and analytical mode separately. Um, so a signal present in less than 80% of the samples in all the groups with a detection rate of less than 70% in the pooled QC were excluded. So if you had one, so one compound detected in less than 80% of all your song, not a compound, a feature in all the groups, and it was only detected 
in 70% or less of the pooled QC, they would exclude that. After that, they would correct for the intensity drift. We refer to that as a batch effect. So um, there's a sort of a batch effect if you do your samples in batches. Um, that can be due to temperature, humidity in the lab, um, your instrument tuning slightly different, you did, you made up a new internal standard, whatever. There can be a lot of reasons why you use your QCs then to correct for a batch effect. Um, so they corrected the drift, then they removed the QC samples. You use your QCs to correct for the drift because remember your QC, QC should be the same or uh, throughout the analysis. Um, they also flag low quality signals um, and they refer to this Clavis guy all the time. You will see that this reference pops up all the time. It's them. So they are referring to their own previous work where they figured out most of these things. Um, so then missing values with high quality signals were imputed using random forest imputations. Um, missing value, you never really get a zero in mass spec. Um, a zero, yeah, there's just a missing value. The zero means that something is absent, it's completely not there, and you've proven that it's not there. A missing value says that this is probably there, but it's below a detection limit. It's below a concentration that we can detect with certainty. Um, so that is why they then sort of impute these zeros. Um, they say they impute it with zeros, but you can also do a zero replacement later on where you, you replace the zeros with very low, very low concentrations, so very low um, numbers. Okay, so they did that. So they processed their data to get rid of everything that's not needed. Remember, at the end, you want to get these features down as far as possible. Um, so now they did stats on the features with R. So they did their own stats. They didn't use Metabo Analyst. Metabo Analyst is the free online metabolomics stats thing that you can use. Um, they didn't do that. So they did their own metabolomics. Um, they did a linear mixed model to fit the, the, the metabolites. Um, they looked at the, in, the effect of the intervention and time, because remember they have uh, samples that were collected at time zero in the middle of the intervention at week six and then at the end at week 12. So they looked at the effect of time and the effect of the intervention, which is the exercise and the interaction between the two uh, in models. Um, Oh, sorry. Uh, and then they even went, okay, so, oh, where was I? So they so, so also did a T test and they said that if there's a P value uh, less than 0 0.5, you would further investigate the signals. Um, and then what they did after that, they only had, uh, oh, they also excluded peak areas of less than. 10,000, so that's a signal to noise thing. So they say if a peak was on the uh, chromatogram had an intensity of 10,000 or lower, you would exclude that. So at the end, they had 5,000 features, which is 100% better than 134,000 features. So now you only have to identify these ones and not 134,000. So this is something that you can work with even if yeah, it's still, for me, it's still massive, but at least it's it's doable. 134,000 is not doable. Okay, so now you have the signals that actually mean something. So they took those to MS dial again, raw data, extracted the MZs, their attention time in the MS MS. So what you do here is you can do this um, sort of on your own will take you a long time, or you can use a library. So there's libraries where they have mass spectrums um, with known values. So someone somewhere in the world injected the compound and said, I injected only alanine. So um, this is definitely how alanine will look at these parameters, uh, these uh, voltages and so on. So 
if you get a mass uh, fragmentation pattern similar to what's in a library, you, you can say that it's probably that compound. Um, so they used MS DAL, they also used uh, online MS spectral databases in their own library, um, just to annotate, to give names to these features. So only after that, they started doing the real stats where they um, tried to um, identify the difference between the group that exercised and the group that didn't exercise. So those are the volcano plots, effect size and p-values. And then at the end, um, so you can use two approaches here. The first approach, you can say everything with an effect size more than 0 0.8 will be a statistically significant marker. And then you can discuss all of those markers, but you can also say like they did, and I actually like this approach, is they say, we're gonna use the top 25 most significant metabolites. So the 25 metabolites that differs the most for each matrix between the two sample groups. So they didn't, so uh, they end up with only 25 that they have to discuss. The study was approved and was part of clinical trial. Okay, so that's um, in short, in long, the methods. And I think that was my focus today because I wanted you to really look at how do we do untargeted metabolomics on an LCMS and what you should consider. Um, I see there's something going on in the chat. Uh, okay, just to thank you. Um, so I'm gonna continue very quickly through the results. Um, but I think just to get back to the methods, this is a very, very good example of how you should do untargeted LCMS analysis, including sample collection, including um, the description of the cohort, the stats, the analysis, the LCMS, the annotation, everything. It's a very good example. So there's clinical characteristics. I'm not really going to go through that, but um, you can have a look at that in detail. So eventually they collect, they had 49 participants. Some opted not to be part of the project. They then had 46 participants. They had allocated 21 to the exercise group, 25 to the control group. In the control group then before they could start the study, they had one person who was afraid of COVID they had a lack of interest in coronary diseases, so they were excluded from the study further. So they ended up with 21 um, participants in the exercise group, 22 in the control group, um, where three were again excluded because they were using antibiotics, and one were excluded in the exercise group because this person was actually on um, diabetes medication and they didn't um, initially um, um, tell them that they were. So they ended up with 20 and 19. And then in the methods, they actually say that while they were collecting adipose tissue, COVID-19 hit, and they couldn't collect it even further from the participants. So from for the adipose, they only had 10 and 9, almost half of the participants. So at the end, they had 20 and 19. That's not a huge group of samples. That's not, a statistician will tell you that's not really big enough. But with the well-defined inclusion and exclusion criteria, I think that's how they got away with it. Results, I'm not going to go through all the clinical features. That's So th this is what I told you earlier is this is all the information they collected that was not metabolomics. Um, and this is also what makes it a very good paper. It's not just metabolomics. I have all of these other clinical features. Um, weight, BMI, they have some lung, uh, liver parameters there, they have all the sugar uh, glucose methods that they did there, then they have VMAX, and you will see that everything stayed relatively the same throughout the whole study between the two groups, it stayed the same, there was no significant p-value except for the waste, they shrink their waste a bit, and then the pulmonary parameters that shows your pulmonary uh, fitness, that had a significant p-value and none of the other things. Um, I'm not going to go through the clinical things. Okay, so metabolite profiling, that's what I want to get to. So this is a visual plot of the results that they obtained. Um, 
for the different matrices. This is a volcano plot. So the things that you see in color, those are significant or statistically significant compounds that will separate your two groups from each other. So the exercise group and the sedentary group were separated uh, by each other. And the separation was mostly based on these compounds. Um, you will see that in here they say that uh, there's an increase in the intervention group that's green and they also say decrease in the intervention group is also green so I think that's another um, uh, editorial mistake that they made in this paper it should have been red so red is increased in the exercise group green is um, decreased in the exercise group and interestingly, and this is what I picked up, is it's not the same. It's not, there's a lot of amino acids there. Um, here you find a lot of um, lipids. Um, in the stool, you see the, the bile acid type compounds. And then in urine, it's more fatty acids and again, amino acids. Something I want to warn students about is just, you cannot interpret results from different tissue in the same way. So I've seen in, in um, different student studies that they will see, you will say, okay, well, I have an increase in phenylalanine in my group, decrease in phenylalanine. And they will search through Google Scholar for what does a decrease in phenylalanine mean? Be careful not to go between matrices because a decrease in phenyl, let's use an example that's actually important in real life and that we all know, glucose. An increase in plasma glucose means that you just had a bowel one. The increase in urine glucose means that you're a diabetic person, you have diabetes. So you cannot jump between matrices if you want to explain reasons behind an increase or a decrease in certain metabolites. Be very careful of that. You wouldn't expect the same variation in plasma and urine. Plasma is what you still need to live. Urine is what you're actually excreting. You don't want that. You want it out of your system. Stool was something that you totally do not need and that was transformed by gut microbiome and all of those lovely things. Adipose, something that's permanently glued to you, except if you lose weight, much difference. So they mention here and they say, they say it as if it's a bad thing. They say um, the, som the metabolic signature in each sample type was different with varying compositions of metabolites, either increasing or decreasing. Um, they say it as if it's a bad thing, it's not, it's a good thing. You should expect it to be different between the different sample types. Um, the biggest difference was amino acids, lipids and bile acids. Um, so uh, amino acids, um, I'm not really going to go into detail here, but it was the proteogenic amino acids that differed the most. Um, in the intervention group, this was something that you would probably expect because of an increased um, muscle mass. So sometimes people tend to go into the explanations also in too much detail for me. I mean, they want to involve enzymes and whatever and whatever and say that this was from drinking water and these people didn't drink more what what. Where in actual fact, if you're all of your amino acids change. It's probably because you have a change in muscle. These people did a lot of exercise. They have a higher muscle, um, muscle um, mass. They have a higher uh, basal metabolic rate. So obviously all of the amino acids will change, especially the proteogenic amino acids, the one that you get from food. Um, so just always be open-headed and um, consider the logical explanation rather than trying to go into too much detail um, of why you see certain things increase and decrease. Um, there you can see a plot. 
Now they show this. Um, uh, sorry, are you still there? Um, they show this, although it doesn't really look like a massive difference to me. Um, so the green would be your um, intervention group, I think, and then the red will be your um, other group. You're supposed to see a big difference there, but it doesn't really look like that big a difference. It looks like there's variation between individuals. So um, this is a nice feature. It looks like you did something, but you can't really get any information from this in my mind. It's just my opinion. I can be wrong. Yeah, so I'm not going to go into it more. I'm not going to go through the whole discussion because the discussion is based on the clinical features, the clinical question that you asked. So um, my take-home message would just be that this is a very good example of untargeted LCMS analysis. Um, what you do with it, the biological question, how you interpret that, the discussion and the introduction is actually irrelevant. If you have a very well-defined aim, you can use this methodology. You can actually just repeat it as it is, and you will know that you have very uh, nice metabolomics data. Um, so they had a lot of explanations at the end, and they say this is a summary of what they got. Exercise intervention will increase and decrease all of these things, and um, it will increase, decrease insulin resistance, improve glucose, improve lipid, regulate energy balance. Um, that will depend, the, the discussion will depend on what you actually studied. My only concern with this paper is that the result says decreased insulin resistance, improved glucose, improved lipid. My question would be, wouldn't this have been true without NAFLD as well? If you start exercising, you will have a in decreased insulin resistance, you will have improved glucose, all of these things will happen to you, even if you do not have NAFLD. So the point that I want to make here is that this study could have been also have been done with individuals without NAFLD, and we would have come to the same exact conclusion. It's about how exercise will change a person, not really if they have NAFLD or not. But that's just my opinion. Um, so anyway, that brings me to the end. I'm not going to go through the discussion in details or anything like that. So sorry, I took too much time. Shane, I think I'm done. <laughs> no, you took pl plenty of step by step. You took us through all the methods. So I think that was excellent to follow up last week's workshop. Where we had Marie and our other talks going through steps by steps of how to approach metabolomics, the design. And I think you, you very well illustrate to us that it's important to understand the methods they use, the approach, the design, step by step, before you get to the results. So I think, yeah, everyone can see that from an expert's point of view, you analyze everything critically and you want to understand everything critically before you get to the results. And you highlight that very nicely to show to everyone that people should read the methods very clearly, very carefully, understand everything. And I think Prof Spearman would have been a great addition at the end then to discuss the results that you, because you propose that it's just exercise, a change on the metabolism from exercise only and Prof Spearman could probably uh, chat a bit about that or her opinion on the results. So I don't know if there are any liver experts in the audience. I know there are metabolomist individuals. Perhaps someone has a question for Ilsa <laughs> on the paper or on untargeted, non-targeted metabolomics in general, specifically LCMS. So you can either raise your hand or you can chat, chat to us in the chat box with your question. So 
there's a comment there. Thank you for a great presentation, Dr. Dupree. It's a pleasure. Nobody has any, there is a hand up. Please unmute and ask your question. All right, uh, thank you again. Uh, uh, Dr. Priest, I want to ask you a question, please. I don't know if uh, it is appropriate to ask you here, kind of. Please forgive me because I'm asking you on this platform. Is there any, I, I have read one of your papers and then I came across this pathway uh, figure that you, I really can't remember the exact paper, but I know I read one of your paper. And I've tried to like a kind of search to see, and most people that have done similar figures make reference to the KEGG. But then when I checked there, I actually wasn't able to get the exact, uh, the way on, in which they do uh, the figures, I don't know. Can you give like a kind of direct recommendation on that? Then secondly, I don't know if this question is uh, going to make sense, but at what point do you refer to the data you obtained from your result as metabolites or biomarkers or futures? Like, because from your presentation seems at different points of your workflow, these three things actually mean a kind of different things. Uh, yeah. So thank you, that's my question. Okay. So the first question, um, I'm not sure if you refer to the actual program that we use to draw these, or if you refer to how do we know if this pathway is actually present in humans. So first of all, we refer to KEC and to um, the Human Metabolome Database and other resources to make sure that this pathway and the enzyme and everything is actually in the human. But then... To be honest with you, um, I never use the KEC presentation of a, of a pathway. It's just too difficult to understand. So I normally, and, and, and I use this resource, it's available for free mostly, and it's super um, difficult to use. It's called um, uh, PowerPoint. So I, <laughs> I literally use PowerPoint as a tool to draw these figures. And then we have on campus this great um, department where you can send your things and then they, they are called the graphics department and then they help you to draw it. So I wasn't sure if you were referring to the actual pathway or how you draw it. Um, but nowadays I, ju I just draw it with my hand and then send it to someone with more graphics experience than I have. The other question is biomarker. I never, ever, ever refer to it anything as a biomarker in metabolomics. Um, a biomarker is something that should have been proven over and over and over that it's clinically relevant and that you can actually use it. So glucose in urine will be a biomarker for, for diabetes. It's been proven, it's been shown, it's been validated. That's a biomarker. I never use the word biomarker. So what we do is... Um, Everything that you analyze, because you take out the proteins, you can refer to actually anything that's left as a metabolite. A metabolite is just something that's smaller than 50 kilodalton. So a metabolite is literally the size of a compound. If a compound is smaller than 50 kilodaltons, it's a metabolite. Um, you can, we refer to them as features before we annotate them, because it's just a mass spec. There's no biological relevance to that. The moment that you put a name to it, we refer to it as, as a metabolite. And then a marker, and it's not a, not a biomarker, just a marker, would be something that is statistically different between groups. So statistically, uh, you will see in this study that glucose changed um, or the amino acids, for example, changed between the two groups and statistically. So they had a p-value that was significant. 
according to the stats rules. In that case, you can say this is a marker. You should always be cautious because this is a marker for your data set, your patients after your analysis. This is not a marker for exercise in NAFLB. So um, yeah, you would do untargeted analysis. And I normally say that untargeted metabolomics is hypothesis generating. This whole paper was done to generate a hypothesis. Nothing in there is proven except that one table where they have the glucose and the ALT and GGT and all those markers. That's actually proven, but nothing is proven from untargeted metabolomics. To prove this, you will have to go and apply this to different NAFLB cohorts across the world, across ages, using different instruments, using different analysts and different methods. And if you get to the same conclusion over and over again and validate that, that will be a biomarker. Hope that helps. Let's not forget that Dr. Ilsa has about two decades of background <laughs> in biochemistry. That's how she's able to draw these figures by hand on PowerPoint first. So most of us have to go to KIG and HMDB to understand step by step, but she has already accumulated a lot of knowledge. So it's much easier for her to draw these things. But I think everyone will get there eventually over time. I also use HMDB. <laughs> <laughs> and for the annotation part, I remember um, Prof. Adele's, um student um, two or three weeks ago presented on her master's project, and they use molecular networking um, to annotate the features that they find on LCMS. So they have a nice system going there on annotation. So it's a step a step process, very tedious, very slow, and difficult to do the annotation part. Are there any other questions? Well, while we wait for any other questions, I want to just send a, a shout out to all our African brothers and sisters outside of South Africa. So from Kenya, Nigeria, Botswana, um, Namibia, Zimbabwe, anyone here in the audience, um, please get in contact with me if you're allowed to present at our journal club or present and what research you guys are doing in your units. So I don't have any of your guys' contact details, but please get in contact with me. I'd love to shine a spotlight on our outside of Africa, our Pan-African colleagues on what they are doing. So please get in contact with me. I'll put my email one more time. Um, I think I'll ask Dr. Ilsa just to put her email there in case anyone has more questions. Thank you again, Ilsa, for a wonderful talk on untargeted LCMS. It's a big pleasure, Shane. Um, just to um, clarify this, this wasn't my own paper. It was yes. someone else's paper. So I actually evaluated as if I was a reviewer. <laughs> Sorry for all my critical thinking. But you shared a lot of critical points for us to think about. So that's the important point I think to put across to everyone. In reading papers, don't just take them for face value because also identified some publishing errors there as well. Nature is a very strong, very high impact paper. And yeah, she identified two publishing errors in one paper. So it's important to read step by step critically. So at that point, I think we all end. Um, next week, we're not going to have a journal club. We're going to take a break. But like I said to all our African brothers and sisters, please contact me. I'd love to shine a spotlight on what you guys are doing there. Or anyone else who wants to present on something interesting, you are more than welcome to contact me. I'm sending out emails to everyone that I know, but I don't have everyone's contact details to get people involved in the journal clubs. Now, in the near future, Ilsa will be presenting again on the Center for Human Metabolomics on more on what the whole center does, but she is very busy at the moment. <laughs> I think this is like her third talk this week. 
So we'll hear from her again in the near future. Okay, with that, I think we can end. Thank you, Malati, for hosting. Thank you to everyone for attending. And hopefully we'll see you again in two weeks time.